With these beautiful thoughts, today we celebrate the prestigious Mahe Professor J.V. Bhatt Memorial Oration 2022, through which we will witness the research journey of an esteemed scientist of the country in the field of microbiology, Dr. Manjula Reddy. On behalf of the organizers, I, Anjali Varyar, a PhD scholar from Manipal School of Life Sciences, Mahe, take immense pleasure in welcoming you all to this occasion of Mahe Professor J.V. Bhatt Memorial Oration 2022, hosted by Manipal School of Life Sciences and Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Mahe Manipal. So before we begin, I would like to invite our respected and eminent dignitaries onto the days. Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Venkatesh, Vice Chancellor, Mahe Manipal. Dr. Manjula Reddy, a distinguished microbiologist and chief scientist at CSIR Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, Hyderabad. And Dr. K. Satyamurthy, director, Manipal School of Life Sciences, Mahe Manipal. Thank you, sirs and madam. As the saying goes, anything well begun is half done. I believe there cannot be a better beginning than by invoking God's blessings in the form of prayer. I would now like to invite Mr. Venkidesh B.S., PhD scholar at MSLS Mahi, to recite the invocation. Thank you, Mr. Venkidesh. I now kindly call upon Dr. T.S. Murali, Associate Professor, Department of Biotechnology, Manipal School of Life Sciences, Mahe, to deliver the welcome address and also to tell us about the genesis of the Mahe Professor J.V. Bhatt Endowment. Good morning to you all. I, Dr. Murli, on behalf of our director, cordially welcome you all to Professor J.V. Butt Memorial Oration for the year 2022. We extend a hearty welcome to Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Venkatesh, Vice Chancellor Mahi, for his wholehearted support in all our activities and for agreeing to deliver the presidential address and present the award. We have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Manjula Reddy, a renowned microbiologist, who has kindly consented to deliver this year's oration. A warm welcome to our beloved director, Dr. Satyamurti, who has been instrumental in planning the whole event. Every year, we have with us family members of Professor J.V. Butt, 
Dr. Gopinath and several other well-wishers on this occasion, but due to some unavoidable circumstances, they could not make it in person this year, but their support and encouragement remains the constant driving force for the successful conduct of this event. We would like to thank and welcome all the donors of the endowment, Professor J.V. Bhatt's students, Dr. Satish Shetty, Dr. Idya Karnasagar, Dr. Shantaram, Dr. Vindra Prabhu, Dr. Damodar Kamath, Dr. R.P. Pai, who is here, and other distinguished personalities to this event. We welcome all HOIs, HODs, faculty members, and students from Manipal School of Life Sciences and various constituent institutions of MAHE. We also extend a warm welcome to press and other electronic media and a warm welcome to those who have joined us online. For the benefit of our students, I would like to provide a brief glimpse on the genesis of Professor J.V. Butt Memorial Oration. Professor Janadan Venkatesh Butt was born on March 3rd, 1913 at Thalasheri and had his early education in Mangaluru. In 1953, Professor Burt was awarded the degree of Doctor of Science of the University of Mumbai, the first ever DSc degree in microbiology awarded by the university. He served for 20 years at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, as head of fermentation technology laboratory, and later as professor and head of the department of microbiology and pharmacology. During this time, he was also a visiting scientist at the NIH Maryland, USA, and later as a postdoctoral fellow in the University of California, Berkeley. On his retirement, Professor Butt joined Kasturba Medical College as Emeritus Professor and Research Director and served with distinction. He was also associated with Indian Council of Agricultural Research, Department of Science and Technology, University Grants Commission, Central Food Technological Research Institute in various capacities. For his contribution in the field of microbiology, he has received the Moose Medal, the Perkinji Medal, Rafi Ahmed Kidwai Memorial Award, and G.J. Vatumul Distinguished Achievement Award. Professor Burt expired in 1985 at Chennai. In his memory, an endowment was created at Manipal with the effort initiated by Professor P.M. Gopinath and with the support of Professor J.V. Butts, family members, associates, well-wishers, students, and Mahe. For the past 15 years, on 3rd March every year, which happens to be Dr. J.V. Butts' birthday, we at Manipal School of Life Sciences invite an eminent scientist of the country working in the field of microbiology to deliver a lecture. This year, the awards committee has chosen Professor Manjula Reddy Chief Scientist at CSAR CCMB Hyderabad for the Oration Award, and we are thankful for her to her for accepting the award as well as agreeing to deliver the lecture in person. We are extremely honored to be part of this rich legacy, and we sincerely hope that this event will enthuse the young minds to achieve extraordinary things in their career. I once again extend a warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much, sir. It is my pleasure to introduce our respected Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Venkatesh. Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Venkatesh graduated from Mysore Medical College in 1978 and was commissioned in Army Medical Corps in 1979. He acquired his MS in ENT from Mumbai University in 1986. He has contributed significantly in the field of medical education, having trained generations of undergraduate and postgraduate students in the Armed Force Medical College, AFMC Pune, having held all the academic positions from reader to dean. He is a recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the prestigious Vishisht Seva Medal by President of India. Following his tenure as Vice Chancellor of Sikkim Manipal University from 2017 to 20, Dr. Venkatesh was appointed as Vice Chancellor of Manipal Academy of Higher Education in 2020. I now humbly request our respected Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General, Dr. M.D. Venkatesh, to give the presidential address. A 
A very good morning to everyone present here. Warm greetings to all of you from Manipal Academy of Higher Education, an institution of eminence deemed to be university. It's a humbling experience for me to be present here today as we join here for the Professor J.V. Butt Memorial Oration for the year 2022. And at the outset, let me thank Dr. Manjula Reddy for accepting the oration and being present here today in person, despite the difficult situations that the entire world is facing. Thank you very much, ma'am. And we are indeed privileged and honored with your presence. <laughs> Dr. Satyamurthy, the most dynamic and effervescent director Manipal School of Life Sciences, all the senior faculty of Manipal School of Life Sciences and other institutions of MAHE. I recognize Dr. R.P. Pai, one of the donors of this endowment, which has been set up in memory of Dr. J.V. Butt, and my dear students, research scholars, press and media, ladies and gentlemen. 3rd March is a special day in the Mahes calendar as we recognize the contributions, immense contribution of late Professor J.V. Bhatt, who after his illustrious career in the country, in the field of microbiology, in the Indian Institute of Science, and earlier during his tenure and overseas, has contributed extraordinary developmental activities, research activities, and administrative leadership to scores of microbiologists in this country. Mahe humbly places its sincere gratitude and recognizes Dr. J.V. Butt for his outstanding contribution as Emeritus Professor in Microbiology and as Director of Research. As has been brought out that uh, this endowment was created by the family members of Dr. J.V. Bhatt, friends and students of Professor J.V. Bhatt, and of course some contribution from the university so this endowment has served its purpose of keeping the memory of the J.V. Butt alive and of recognizing his contribution in the field of microbiology and to the society as a whole, evergreen, and also to inspire the younger generation of people to think differently and do things differently. However, keeping everything in mind that whatever you do should make a benefit to the community that we are living in and to the people for whom we are all working for. The, for the last 14 years, the list of recipients of this extremely prestigious oration is extremely humbling and satis satisfying to the university and to the the, all the donors of this oration. In fact, we have been able to receive the oratory lectures of extremely eminent scientists and researchers like Dr. Karuna Sagar, Dr. Gauri Shankar, Dr. G.B. Nair, Dr. Durga Rao, Dr. V. Nagaraja, Dr. Saeed Hasnain, Indrani, Karuna Sagar, S.P. Thyagarajan, Dr. Harshwardhan Batra, Dr. Umesh Varshne, Dr. K. Dharmalingam, Mr. M Dr. M. K. Lalita, Dr. D. N. Rao, Dr. Alok Bhattacharya, and Dr. Kishore Panknika. The names evoke a lot of respect and recognition for all of us. And to add to the list of these illustrious recipients of the oration, I'm extremely happy and proud that Dr. Manjula Reddy is here today as the orator for this prestigious award, and she's going to enlighten us on 
her research and her future thoughts. And uh, Dr. Manjula Reddy is the chief scientist at CSIR, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in Hyderabad, one of the most renowned research institutes of the country. Her immense contribution in the field of microbiology especially focused towards understanding how bacteria elongate, divide, and split their cell walls during cell cycle. Her studies allows us to get better understanding of fundamental aspects of bacterial physiology, especially in arriving at novel strategies for development of alternate antimicrobial therapeutics. Extremely novel, extremely important as the world grapples and struggles with bacterial res antibiotic resistance. The entire world is facing this crowd of bacteria which is literally resistant to all available bacteria. And the scientists have to work that much harder to provide some answer to the bacteria which perhaps are always two steps ahead of the man. And therefore, it's important that we research and find alternate antimicrobial therapeutic solutions outside the limbs of antibiotics, which hitherto have been the cornerstone in treating bacterial infections. The world is changing, so are the therapeutics, so are the research ideas, research fields, and therefore I'm sure Dr. Manjula Reddy's oration today is going to bring in newer thought process amongst all of us who are present here today, and also inspire and motivate young researchers who are sitting here towards considering, you know, path-breaking research in finding solutions to the, this crouch of antibacterial resistance in human beings, animals, and in agricultural fields. The spirit of One Health has to come into all of us. I think all of us, as we grow, as we have grown towards, as we progress, have become much narrower and narrower in our field. And the world is now thinking of One Health we are looking at agricultural health, we are looking at animal health, we are looking at human health, and perhaps somewhere down the line we have lost the track that all of them have got equal importance in the world that we live in. So this is something that I would like to impress upon our young researchers who are present here today. And also, orations have some very important objectives. First objectives of, you know, uh, setting up uh, an oration in recognition and in memory of somebody who's done an extraordinary contribution or an illustrious personality is first to keep his memory alive and to recognize his contribution, which is either to, for which he was known for or he or she was known for. So this is very important and also second is to recognize and honor some of the, the illustrious researchers and professionals who are following in the directions provided by this, you know, doyens in the field on which these orations have been set up, set up. And third important thing is, it's about inspiring younger minds. It's about bringing in new thought processes. It is about bringing in new networking opportunities. And uh, perhaps after listening to illustrious people like Dr. Manjula Reddy, there'll be new changes that occur in you in your thought process and newer ideas may come up towards newer research, towards making things better. I've always been saying that research that is confined to a laboratory which ends at publication is not the expression of research at all. It's just a very small component of research. A research is truly revolutionary when it, when it alters the way or makes things better for the community in which we are living in. Therefore, we, we must stop being you know, happy by seeing our name in print. There is a need for perseverance and continued efforts to take this fundamental research which has led to your publication to the next level from from the laboratory to the community for the benefit of the people and make that transitional change 
translational research is something that we need to continuously focus on. So on this day, on the birthday, I humbly give my regards and homage to Dr. J.V. Butt on behalf of everyone present here, on behalf of the university, bow my head in reverence to this great personality. And once again, thank Dr. Manjula Reddy for accepting the invitation of Manipal School of Life Sciences in Mahi to deliver late Professor J.V. Butt memorial orations on this day. With this, I will end my two words. Thank you all very much and Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking address. I now request Ms. Apurva Jnana, PhD scholar, MSLS Mahi, to introduce our guest orator, Dr. Manjula Reddy, Chief Scientist, CSIR CCMB, Hyderabad. Good morning to all gathered here. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Manjula Reddy, the recipient of the prestigious Mahe Professor J.V. Butt Memorial Oration Award for the year 2022. Dr. Manjula Reddy obtained her PhD in microbiology with a focus on the stationary phase mutagenesis of Escherichia coli in the year 2002 from the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, CSIR CCMB, in Hyderabad, India. She carried out her postdoctoral research at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Seattle, USA. She is currently the chief scientist at CSIR CCMB, Hyderabad, India. Dr. Reddy has a long-standing experience in the field of microbiology. Her research is primarily on understanding bacterial cell wall synthesis and its regulation using E. coli as a model organism. She has actively contributed to the field of microbial research with 23 publications in highly prestigious journals such as PNAS, Nature Communications, MBio, and several others with more than 800 citations. Dr. Reddy is currently a member of the editorial board of Journal of Bacteriology published by the American Society of Microbiology. She is a fellow at several reputed organizations such as Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore, Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, and Telangana Academy of Sciences. Additionally, she was a part of the team of scientists who patented the process for identifying mutagens and anti-mutagens. In 2019, Dr. Reddy received the Infosys Prize in Biological Sciences for identifying a novel space maker enzyme in Escherichia coli that hydrolyzes certain crosslinks in peptidoglycan, thereby allowing the bacterial cell wall to expand. Through elegant genetic and biochemical analysis, Dr. Reddy and her colleagues have revealed critical steps of cell wall growth that are fundamental for understanding bacterial biology and have important implications for the development of novel classes of antibiotics. I now kindly invite Dr. Manjula Reddy to deliver the guest lecture. Thank you, Ms. Apurva. I now sincerely request our respected Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, to hand over the citation and plaque to Dr. Manjula Reddy. Thank you, sir. Now we will be starting with the oration by Dr. Manjula Reddy. I humbly re request our respected dignitaries on days to kindly take their seats among the audience. And I sincerely request Dr. Manjula Reddy to please deliver the oration.
Dear friends, it's a great honor to be here today talking to you on the occasion of uh, 109th birthday of uh, Professor Janardhan Bhatt. I am sincerely thankful for the invitation uh, and also kind of I'm overwhelmed by the excellent hospitality of the organizers and uh, particularly to do Professor Satyamurti who's here and then uh, Dr. Murli for the invitation. And I'm also thankful to the Vice Chancellor who's here, uh, keeping aside all his uh, uh, commitments for being here today. Thank you very much. So my lab at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology at Hyderabad works on understanding the bacterial cell wall synthesis. And uh, as Apurva has nicely summarized my work, so from last 20 years or so, we have been working on bacterial cell walls. And I'm going to briefly tell you about what we have done till now and what we are going to do now. So I think most of you are very well aware of uh, uh, how bacteria live, grow, and survive. All of us know that they're very ubiquitous, right? So extreme, like present everywhere on the earth, in deep seas, in their uh, hosts, in plants, in animals, almost like everywhere, right? And they're mostly unicellular. So then how do they survive in these extreme habitats, right? What are the properties of bacteria which make them grow and then tolerate these extreme habitats is, is a question, right? And as you can see here, different bacteria, they come in different shapes and sizes. You can see some cocci here, rod-shaped bacteria, and some of them are like cocked screws, which are mostly spirochetes, which cause diseases like leptospirosis, syphilis, and uh, uh, Borrelia, etc. Right Now, all these bacteria are protected by a cell wall against particularly the harsh environmental conditions which fluctuate all the time in their uh, life cycle. And then they also protect against the intracellular osmotic pressure which comes from within the cytosol, right? Of course, there are also cell wall-less bacteria like chlamydia and mycoplasmas, but these grow in osmotically inert or osmotically stable conditions like because they're mostly intracellular. Right? They grow in macrophages and... Uh, in different tissues. So based on their cell walls, we know that they're kind of divided into two broad classes. I'm sure most of you would have heard about this classification. So in, in gram-negative organisms, there is a different cell wall organization, whereas in gram-positives, it is slightly variant. So as you can see here, the, the cell membrane is the a lipid bilayer that encloses the cytoplasm, whereas there is an ex additional outer membrane which is made up of phospholipids and also lipopolysaccharides. Right? In between these two membranes is a space called periplasm in which a sac-like molecule is placed and that is called the peptidoglycan. So my work is mostly focused towards peptidoglycan and today I'm going to talk about that. As opposed to gram negatives, gram positives, the, though the theme is essentially the same, there are variations, it lacks the outer membrane, but compensates with a very thick layer of peptidoglycan, right? You can actually see it here. So both the thick peptidoglycan layer of gram positives or the outer membrane of gram negative, they serve more or less the same purpose. They do not allow any harmful chemicals to come from outside. Right? And then they serve as protective layer for the bacteria. Right? Why do people study bacterial cell walls? Right? They actually look pretty inert. Right? They kind of, and people seem to be knowing a lot of things about bacterial cell walls. Right? Still, we do not understand the how cell walls are synthesized, how they are regulated. Right? And so the basic question is to ask fundamental biological questions, right? How do cell walls grow, right? How, do, how are they synthesized? Because we talked about different components which make the cell wall. 
And the other important translational aspect is bacterial cell walls are excellent targets of antibiotics. We all know from here, we all recognize these antibiotics and we would have taken one or the other in our lifetime, particularly the beta-lactams, which are the penicillins, cephalosporins, etc. And these are the glycopeptides like vancomycin, bacitracin, and phosphomycin. Right? These are very well characterized and then we use them. However, the cell wall still remains an excellent target of antibiotics because these targets are not present in vertebrate hosts. We can use this target as a unique target to make new antibiotics. Right? And lately, there's a lot of interest in the role of cell walls in the infection and immunity of the host. Right now, everybody talks of microbiome. We all know that humans have a lot more cells of microbes than our own cells. Right Now, which means that they all grow in our body. Where is all the cell wall going? Right? So, which means that you have a lot of lipopolysaccharide, which people know that it is a very good immunogen. Right? And then peptidoglycan is recently coming out to be an immunomodulator in us. In addition, now there's a lot of new evidence which is coming that the peptidoglycan fragments, in fact, help us in proper development, right? And then also getting immunity. So we hear a lot about these auto-inflammatory disorders, which are mostly caused because of the cell walls of different microbes which are present in us. Of course, here, my initial interest came with understanding the basic bacterial biology. Then I'm, I'm going to talk more about this. Right? This slide shows an extremely simple schematic of bacterial cell cycle. Right? So whenever a newborn bacterial cell sees favorable conditions and then a lot of nutrients, it grows in length. You can see that the single circular chromosome, which most bacteria have, gets duplicated. Right? And then it elongates further. And then a, at the mid-cell, a cell septum forms. And then eventually, that septum gets separated. And then two daughter cells form again. And this cycle goes on if there are favorable conditions in the vicinity. Extremely simple, right? So, but if you look, and I'm also going to tell that our lab is interested in all these steps of elongation, division, and separation. But for today's talk, I'm going to talk a lot about the elongation. Now, if you see it carefully, the whatever this blue line represents is the cell wall, right? You can see that in two phases of growth, this cell wall is growing. One is in the elongation phase, where the length of this daughter cell is increasing almost to become double before it actually becomes a mother cell and then for the separation of two daughter cells. In addition, if you see at the mid-cell, there's a lot of synthesis which is happening in the middle of the cell, right? So both during elongation and division, there's a lot of cell wall synthesis ha is happening, right? So I'm going to a lot talk about the elongation, as I said earlier, though I will briefly mention about the division. Now, we just saw a blue line, right? So what does that blue line actually represent? Right? I'm going to li little bit describe how the chemical structure looks like. So we work on extremely well-studied model organism, Escherichia coli, a gram-negative rod-shaped bacterium. And this is, again, a schematic. You can kind of think that this green one is the outer membrane. Then if you open up, then there is an inner membrane, which is this lighter green color. And in between is the peptidoglycan. Now, the peptidoglycan, as the name suggests, is is made up of glycans and the peptides. Very simple structure. It's, it's a uh, polymer, right? And the subunit in that polymer is what you see here, a simple sugar, N-acetyl glucosamine attached to N-acetyl muramic acid, 
And if you actually think about this, this is bonded by beta-1,4 bonds, these uh, two sugar molecules. And this beta-1,4 in, in the evolution of animals and bacteria and all that is a very strong binding, um, uh, binding force because you see that in chitin, cellulose, in all biological macromolecules, where sugars are the backbone, you see this bond, right? So even the, it would have evolved from bacteria and then this could have been the um, ancestral molecule. So now to this simple sugar, there are four unusual amino acids added to this. Of course, L-alanine is not unusual, but you can see this is a D-glutamic acid, mesodiaminopamilic acid, which is a dibasic amino acid, a rare amino acid, except in bacterial cell walls, you actually don't find it anywhere. And this is D-alanine. Because of these unusual amino acids, peptidoglycan structure is pretty unique, right? Now, these precursor molecules are joined together. So you can see these uh, blue ones as the glycan strands. And in each precursor, the murnac is attached to these peptides. Now, this is a pretty inert structure, but what makes peptidoglycan very flexible, elastic is the crosslinks which connect the peptide chains. So there are three kinds of crosslinks which normally uh, bacteria have. So one very um, predominant crosslink is between what you actually see here. So this is a D-alanine of one peptide and attached to an mesodiaminopamilic acid of the another peptide which is adjacent to it. And here you see there is a bond between mesodiaminopamilic acid to another mesodiaminopamilic acid. So people call these as 3-3 three, three bonds because the, the, that's the third amino acid. This is the 4-3 bond. In addition to that, the peptidoglycan is actually tethered to the outer membrane by an extremely abundant protein called LPP. So these three things give the most gram-negative bacterial cell walls the flexibility. Now, the crosslinks also make this peptidoglycan into a single molecule because there's covalent crosslinks in the middle. So now somebody asks, what's the largest molecule in bacteria? It's obviously the peptidoglycan, right? It's almost 10 to the power of 6. Um, kilodalton, and then it is, it, it, it's, it's a pretty big one. So I'm sorry for a busy slide, but I just wanted to uh, tell you in this slide to say that the, remember the peptidoglycan is in the periplasmic space where there is no energy, okay? There are no ATP, there is no energy-rich intermediates. So the synthesis must happen in the cytosol, which happens. Then here you see the precursor with this disaccharide. So all the precursors are flipped across the inner membrane into the periplasm. And here the precursors are polymerized into the existing peptidoglycan saculus. Now, we just heard that the peptidoglycan synthesis actually happens at two times, right? both during cell elongation and at cell division. So which means that the precursors need to go to two places and that's where this happens. During cell elongation, the precursors are going to the side wall to make this newborn cell into a mother cell longer. And here, during the division, the precursors are going to the mid cell at the mother cell. So therefore, now there is a a uh, very thick band of peptidoglycan here, which gets separated by peptidoglycan hydrolases to release these two daughter cells. Now, for this to happen, bacteria has very distinct peptidoglycan synthetic machineries. Okay, so one for the elongation and one for the division. And this slide shows the two components these are multi-protein complexes. One does the elongation. You can see it here that the elongation is happening 
randomly at the side wall to make the peptidoglycan, whereas during, at, for division, there's a almost 30 protein complex, which is called divisome, which goes into the mid cell, and then this is, this depicts only the, the association of these important proteins. All of these proteins are essential. If you do not have this elongosome, cells cannot grow, right? And again, if you do not have divisomal components, cells are not going to grow. So if this slide just, I mean, no, no, tells you how the elongation defective mutants of E. coli um, look like. So they, they do not maintain their rod shape, they eventually die. This is just before death. So these two, called MREBCD and RODZ, are the elongosomal components, and if you do not have, the cells die. And then if you do not have that mid-cell protein called FTSZ, they are not able to divide, so they grow as very long filaments before they eventually lyse and die. Because this is not drawn to the scale, so please do not look at the, uh, the, the scale bar. Right? Now, coming to the, my own work, right? Now, I was interested in how do peptidoglycans expand. I said before that the peptidoglycan is a single large molecule, right? Now, if that single large molecule has to grow, right, in size and length, what are the factors required was my research question when I started something like 15 years ago. So people knew or hypothesized that the synthesis of peptidoglycan most likely involves a synthetase which polymerizes the precursors into the peptidoglycan saccules and, and an enzyme called endopeptidase which will cut the covalent crosslinks in the middle so that the new material can go inside. Okay, this of course is a simulation and you can see that there is random cutting in the peptidoglycan saccules and this new peptidoglycan is being formed at the diffusely in the mid cell in the body elongating the cell. However, this is a hypothesis. So when we started then we actually thought that if that is true, then the crosslinks need to be broken during this enlargement of pe peptidoglycan saccules. So we started looking for them. Essentially, e genes or enzymes which are able to cut very specifically these peptidoglycan crosslinks. If you remember, I said there are two kinds, 4, 3, and then 3, 3 kinds, right? So then we, I, I'm a trained geneticist, so we started with genetic approach, then went into biochemistry and some biophysical techniques to understand this. So then our hypothesis was the cleavage of these crosslinks is required for the peptidoglycan expansion, and that should happen. The cleavage should be immediately followed by the insertion of this new nascent strands, and then further polymerization into this mesh-like you know, saccules so that it gets elongated. So this is the one where I was talking about the crosslinks. Two major crosslinks have evolved in, in bacterial systems, either the 4-3 or the 3-3. But you can see that in organisms like mycobacterium, there are my, predominantly 3-3 crosslinks exist. People do not know what is the advantage with 3-3 or 4-3 crosslinks, but that's the way it is, as you can see uh, for now. So we started looking at the genes which initially cut these 4-3 crosslinks, then using several genetic screens and genetic methods, we identified three unknown open reading frames in E. coli, which we eventually re renamed as MEP, S, M, and H. MEP stands for murin endopeptidase. So then what, what comes ne next is that when we tried to remove each endopeptidase from E. coli cell, 
by doing mutant analysis, right? It's, it's pretty easy to do mutations in E. coli. So if you remove MEP-S alone from E. coli, it grows pretty much quite well on two different kinds of medium. LB here is rich medium, and this is minimal medium, which is a synthetic medium and which is considered poor for the, uh, in terms of nutrients. But however, if you remove both MEP, S, and M, you can see that the cells do not grow on LB, but then they can grow on minimal medium. But when you do not have these three genes, S, M, H, they do not grow on any media. And this indicates only that these three genes are redundantly essential for growth of E. coli, but this doesn't tell us anything about the peptidoglycan. So the next few experiments told us that these are actually the, the endopeptidases or the cross-link cleaving enzymes which we are looking for. This is a slide which shows how the SMH mutants lies. This is a scanning electron microscopy. So you, if you remove all three enzymes, they actually are basically not able to uh, elongate. They become this oval shaped before they lice. Right? I j also want to add on one point here. So if the MEP, SMH are essential for the growth of E. coli, then how can you actually make them grow in the laboratory? Right? So we normally have MEP, S cloned on an inducible uh, under an inducible promoter system. So this is inducible by addition of arabinose. So whenever you add arabinose, the MEP-S is made, right? And then you can see that they're all growing. And when you add glucose, which is the repressor, then the, the MEP-S is not made, and then you can basically deplete cells of all the three um, proteins. So this is how that experiment has been done. Right? Now, what do these MEP-SMH do? So to do that, we hypothesized that they could be cleaving the crosslinks. So we had to make then, we were actually not getting peptidoglycan substrates commercially, so we had to make our own peptidoglycan. So realized in that process that it is quite simple to make peptidoglycan. So you take E. coli cells, boil with SDS so that all the proteins fall off, right? And then, uh, and then treat with proteinase so that then all the cellular proteins actually go away. You are left with uh, just the bare peptidoglycan saculi. You can actually see peptidoglycan, everyone says peptidoglycan gives the cells its shape, right? So if you start with rod-shaped bacteria, you actually get, end up with rod-shaped peptidoglycan saculi. Then once you have them, then you treat with an enzyme which has a specificity like lysozyme, which all of us know it is a muramidase. It cuts those sugars, those disaccharides. Then you get these soluble muropeptides. It's a pool of muropeptides, which can be separated by reverse phase uh, high pressure liquid chromatography. And this is a typical picture you get when you analyze peptidoglycan saculi of E. coli. One can identify what this peaks has with uh, either MALDI or mass spectrometry, and that's how we have identified which peaks are these. So after identifying the peaks, then we have realized that this peak, which you see as number four, is a dimer of a muropeptide. You can see that this is a, a, a sugar molecule, a precursor, attached by this crosslink, right? So this, what we call as tetra-tetra, is a dimer, and number two is a monomer. Now, we overexpress this MAP-SMH, purified those proteins, and when we add these purified proteins in vitro to a mixture of muropeptides, which are shown here, then all of them now will become two alone, so which says that the tetra-tetra is cleaved to tetra, right? So this have the cross-link cleaving ability. So to our surprise, we saw that all, the, all these three have identical enzymatic specificity, and that 
told us that these three endopeptidases are required for the E. coli growth and for the peptidoglycan expansion. So my uh, a student who came after, uh, uh, you know, after that work was done, he was interested in looking at then what happens to the 3-3 three, three crosslinks. So what my first student had got is three enzymes which actually cut the 4-3 crosslinks. So this new one wanted to see what is the effect of having 3-3 three, three crosslinks in the peptidoglycan. So again, using some extensive genetic screens, he identified a new uh, gene and then he renamed as MEPK because this he showed again that this cuts now the bond between the two mesodiamonopamilic acid. Of course, this is a peptide bond. So then he renames as MEPK. Now, what we have at this point is we have four enzymes which are MEP SMH, which are the 4 3 cutters, and then MEPK, which is a 3 3 cutter. We show that all four of them together are able to cleave the crosslinks. Of course, we already know that the mutants lacking any three of them die. Right? Now, this now model gives more questions now. So if the crosslink cleavage is done by these, then this needs to be immediately followed by the new strand insertion and then the formation. So which means that the cleavage must be coupled to synthesis and this cleavage must occur only in the elongation phase of the growth cycle. This is very important. Otherwise, these cross-link ones can cleave the peptidoglycan, right? It can lead to lethal degradation of the peptidoglycan and cell lysis. That should not happen. The cleavage must occur only when there is need for the cells to expand during growth and then during nutrient uh, uh, replete conditions. How does that happen? So we always knew that of all these four, MEPES is more crucial for the growth of E. coli. So we assumed that it could be regulated. So we started looking at the regulation of MEPES, which is essentially the crosslink cleavage because MEPES mediates the crosslink hydrolysis. So we ident in that process, we identified two factors, which these were already known, so we didn't have to rename them. These are called NLPI and PRC as genetic interactors of MEPES. I'll, I'll just briefly go over this because I think for the students it would be good. So you can actually see that uh, in LB, in rich medium, all the mutants, MEPS mutant, NLPI mutant, and PRC mutant, they all grow well. But if you look at LB without sodium chloride, right? I don't, I don't know how many of you have actually made LB. LB has good amount of sodium chloride. So if you do not have osmotic solute in this, the NLPI and PRC mutants are not growing. Right? You can see the uh, empty lanes here. But when you do not have MEPES also in them, look, this is a double mutant of E. coli not having NLPI and MEPES. So, Removing MEPES from NLPI and PRC mutants is making them grow again, right, on LBON. What does this indicate is pretty profound. It says that most probably MEPES is regulated by these two factors, okay? So when you do not have uh, NLPI and PRC, MEPES is upregulated, so they, therefore they are dying, right? And then the removing MEPES is making them grow. So this is a genetic observation which we have taken it further, and then finally show that the MEPES is regulated at the step of proteolysis, right? By this adapter protease complex, which is NLPI-PRC. We have shown that NLPI-PRC interact by doing a lot of immunoprecipitations and all that. This is a Western blot, which is done after doing a pulse chase experiment. This is done basically to see what is the half-life of the proteins, okay? So because this is done after adding a translation inhibitor like 
chloramphenicol or spectinomycin to the medium. And then now you are looking at the level of the protein. This is MEPES. So we made MEPES antibodies to MEPES and then looked at it. And you can see that the MEPES protein in wild type cell gets rapidly degraded. Right? In 30 minutes, it's all done. But if you have a mutant of NLPA or PRC, MEPES is not getting degraded. Right? So, which means that NLPI and PRC together control the degradation of MEPES. Now, this is an in vivo experiment. We also did an in vitro degradation. So, we purified MEPES, NLPI and PRC. You can see that these three proteins. And if you add all of them together, you see the last two lanes. So, if you just incubate it for three minutes, all of MEPES is getting degraded by the PRC and NLPI. So PRC is a protease, it's a periplasmic protease, known earlier, but people didn't know what was its substrate. Okay, now for the first time we were actually showing that here MEPES is its physiological substrate. And this degradation does not happen, you can see in the third lane from the last, if you do not add NLPI, this degradation is not happening. So NLPI is an adapter which brings the PRC and MEPES together so that MEPES gets degraded. So now these observations were uh, confirmed by doing uh, uh, X-ray crystals. We collaborated with uh, uh, Chang in uh, Taiwan and then showed that NLPI, PRC together forms a complex. Again, it's a, it's a busy slide. So you can see that this, this is an NLPI forms a dimer and interacts with PRC. And then you can see that only when they bind to each other, then it, MEPES comes in the middle and MEPES is now degraded by PRC. Now, what does these observations tell us? Now we actually, based on all these observations, we make a model that NLPI regulates the degradation of MEPES. How does, I mean, how and why, right? If you can see the localization of these proteins in the periplasm, NLPI and MEPES are outer membrane lipoproteins. You can see that they are, you know, hanging on to the outer membrane through this small fatty acid chains like this, and PRC is a soluble periplasmic protein. Now, all three of them have to come together, right, for the degradation of MEPES to happen. So then we made this model that the MEPES is degraded. Remember, MEPES cleaves the, these cross links in the middle. So it, that's not good. So then the MEPES is normally degraded by the NLPI PRC system whenever there is no need for PG expansion, right? So whenever cells are in stationary phase or when cell, there are no nutrients, MEPES is degraded rapidly so that there is no cleavage, so there is no damage to the peptidoglycan. However, when there is active cell growth, right, the MEPES is stabilized, then the MEPES will cut these crosslinks, then the new strands will get inserted, and then the peptidoglycan expansion occurs. Very good model. But then how does then NLPI PRC system know when to degrade MEPES? What is the signal of this nutrient depletion or stationary phase come to NLPI, right? That's currently not known, and then we're trying to figure out how and why NLPI PRC would, you know, at what conditions it would bind to MEPES and then start degrading. So to reiterate again, now what this means is most likely the MEPES is active and stable only in this condition when the cells are in the elongation mode, but not during maybe division or separation. Right? That's what we have coming to. But then what is the, the driving force for the MEPA stabilization, which happens only in this condition, is, needs to be figured out now. 
right? If, if you remember earlier, I also talked of the uh, tethering of outer membrane to the peptidoglycan, right? And you can see these uh, uh, cark-like alpha helices, which attach the uh, peptidoglycan to the outer membrane. You know, LPP is the most abundant protein in E. coli. There are around 10 to the power of 7 molecules, right? And uh, if you do not have LPP, actually cells become very permeable to a lot of antibiotics and uh, other hydrophobic reagents because it, it's essentially loosened, right? The peptidoglycan is loose, and then the integrity of the cell, cell wall is lost. So we wanted to see whether this has any role in the peptidoglycan expansion. And then we tried to figure out how the LPP binding to the peptidoglycan is regulated. In that process, my another student called uh, uh, Raj, Raj Bahadur, he again did a lot of genetic screens and then figured out that a new enzyme called LDTF cleaves the LPP from the peptidoglycan saculus. Essentially, this lysis are, are the C-terminal amino acids of the LPP. So LPP is, uh, is attached to peptidoglycan by the last amino acid, L-lysine, and this is a peptide bond. So what he shows essentially is LDTF cleaves this bond. But to his surprise, he sees that LDTF has no role in peptidoglycan expansion, unlike MEP. SMHK, this has, but this has a bearing on the plasticity of the peptidoglycan saculus. So, mo most probably, <coughs> most probably it is kind of, you know, it, it's loose. Uh, at this point of the uh, time, I actually want to give you, uh, uh, you know, want you to imagine that if this room is like a bacterial cell, right? Now, if this room is kept in a um, fluctuating osmotic environment, you know that the water moves in and water moves out, right? So this room, though it is made up of brick walls, needs to be very flexible, right? Elastic is, is the point. So it, it needs to become big and it needs to become small. Now, for this to happen, right? It has to be flexible, and all these crosslinks help in making the peptidoglycan saculus elastic. And at the same time, it has to be rigid enough, right? It cannot um, uh, go beyond the dimensions to this. Uh, and then, at the same time, it needs to elongate in the elongation cycle, almost double in length, right? Imagine, how can you actually make this room bigger, longer, unless you break the walls? So exactly this research says that you need to break the bricks in the middle to make space so that the new br bricks are put and then the cells, I mean, this, this length is going to increase, right? It's, it's as simple as this in, in, in layman's terms. So in this process, LDTF has no role, right? But the other uh, um, enzymes have. So now, till now what I said is, so the peptidoglycan hydrolysis, which is mediated by these SMHK, is crucial for opening the mesh, for incorporation of new material, and therefore the peptidoglycan expands in the elongation phase of the bacterial cell cycle. However, the activity of LDTF is not important for the peptidoglycan expansion, but it is important for the bacterial survival in the fluctuating osmotic environments, which means that it gives mostly the flexibility required to survive in the, um, you know, in, in uh, environmental conditions, because environmental conditions are always, do not have the same, uh, you know, same salt concentrations, right? They're, they're going to be highly variable. Now, coming to slightly a translational angle, so we wanted to see whether, now what we identified is cross-link cleavage is essential for growth of E. coli, right? And this cleavage is done by these endopeptidases. Now, can you target these endopeptidases, right, for developing new drugs or it, can it be a drug target? So as I said before, there are a lot of um, antibiotics which uh, target cell wall synthesis. 
but there are none which target the endopeptidases. So no inhibitors are known before, and these enzymes are extremely uh, conserved, in both in gram-negative and gram-positives. So, and then the crystal structure of several family members were known already. So we did the docking studies and then saw that what kind of molecules actually fit this uh, pocket and uh, came up with some structures. And then we talked with, uh, collaborated with a sister lab of ours, which is called Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, which is immediately adjacent to CCMB. And then we got some molecules which are like this small molecule. And then we screened those molecules against the E. coli. So for that, again, we did a genetic screen, a positive genetic screen, uh, which you actually have seen this before. Remember, this mutant of E. coli, which lacks NLPI, cannot grow on LB plates without sodium chloride. But however, if you remove MEPES from that background, or now if you can inhibit MEPES with this new molecule, then it should start growing, right? Now you see that a deletion of MEPES is growing, so which means now in this background, you slightly deplete MEPES with this added new molecule, now it should start growing, right? It's, it's a positive cell-based assay, so that's what we did. We screened around 2,000 and came up with few molecules. Of course, in this uh, graph shows that these molecules give only a very small growth advantage to the NLPI mutants. So NLPI mutants grow quite slowly in LBON, but then if you add these something like one to two uh, micromolar concentration, they are able to you know, slightly uh, promote growth and we also see that the uh, NLPI mutants, which are slightly longer than the wild type, now when you add, grow with these uh, uh, inhibitors, they're slightly better than NLPI, saying that they are actually, have potential to inhibit the MEPES-like uh, molecules. This needs to be further you know, uh, uh, taken on and then we are, we're trying to uh, improve the screens and, and trying to uh, also look for uh, more inhibitors. I was also talking about the role of peptidoglycan in, uh, in, the, in the host systems, right? Now, um, we all know that the peptidoglycan fragments are very potent agonists of, there are peptidoglycan recognition proteins coming from drosophila onwards to humans, right? They all bind very small fragments of peptidoglycan and then they uh, kind of take it into the, uh, you know, there's a cascade of signaling reactions which happen and then finally cells make these uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, etc. You can actually see it here that the, the, if there are either pathogens or even if non-pathogenic bacteria, the, they can release these small molecules which are derived from the peptidoglycan, right? And then the, there are two very well-studied intracellular receptors in macrophages, which are called as NOD1 and NOD2. People know from long time that NOD1 recognizes this dipeptide and NOD2 recognizes muramyl dipeptides whose structures you can actually see here. Both are derived from peptidoglycan, okay? Now, these NOD1 and NOD2, in turn, right, through a cascade of reactions, can bind to NF-kappa B, so that now this is the one which makes a lot of interferons and cytokines leading to inflammation of the cell. These, in turn, now will take care of these pathogens, right? Now, how are these generated in the host? Right, that's the question. Now you know that the peptidoglycan has very unusual amino acids. The normal human proteases do not cut the peptidoglycan, except the lysozyme, right? Now, so what is the source of MDP and what is the source of DAP is not very clear, but people are kind of thinking that the, most probably the 
our gut micro gut microbial peptidoglycan hydrolases which are released into the medium are the ones which are making these uh, uh, you know, these fragments so this is what we would actually like to see how are the ligands of not one and not two are generated and what kind of hosts will generate these peptidoglycan hydrolases because we which would mean that if you if you Im imagine again our gut microbiome then these hydrolases have to come out of the their environment they have to become extracellular and then cut the peptidoglycan which is in the in the you know uh, in the vicinity and then then these fragments now will serve as the signaling molecules right whether does that happen is is what we want to uh, see now uh, earlier uh, methods of peptidoglycan derivative detection in hosts was very difficult because we did not have sensitive techniques now people know that you can actually uh, look at these muropeptides people see that our blood has a lot of these muropeptides you know which are floating which are actually crossing the blood brain barrier so which would indicate that the this gut gut microbiota or whatever the the microbiome which we have plays an active role in the uh, inflammation and also in the immunomodulation in the in the host so uh, essentially now the take home from uh, last 30 to 40 minutes thing is now what we showed is peptidoglycan hydrolysis is an essential rate limiting step for its expansion so this can be a very good antibiotic target so we have shown initially for e coli so what's very satisfying now is uh, other groups now have shown that it's equally true for bacillus vibrio pseudomonas salmonella which are all, um, you know uh, belong to both gram negative and gram positive uh, uh, classes so essentially then what they show is the hydrolases are important for the peptidoglycan expansion and then we think that we can actually take it further and then see whether we can get any inhibitors for this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, endopeptidases. Right, and I want to end by uh, showing this slide. So when I talked about this expansion of the room, right, and I said that if this is a bacterium, then how will you expand it? There's one way of expansion is you break this in between walls and then make it longer so that you actually keep the that side wall and this side wall intact so the poles of the bacteria are intact and you are essentially elongating the body of the bacterium right but then there are different ways of doing making this uh, room bigger you can actually just break this wall and then go that side right make more material or go onto the that side also, or go on both sides, right? There are different ways of making this room bigger, and that's exactly different bacteria do. And people did not know how to examine this, but right now we have this fluorescent derivatives of D-alanine. If you remember, D-alanine was part of that peptide chain. You can use this to visualize zones of active cell wall synthesis. And using these techniques, other people have shown that if you look at this agrobacterium and colobacter, which are alpha proteobacteria, they actually take the approach of elongating from one pole, one side. Okay? You can actually see that the fluorescence is here on one side. Okay? And now, things like streptomyces, they elongate from a Again, a pole, you can see that there is all the fluorescence is only on the one side, right? And if you see E. coli, for example, the fluorescence is all over the body and also at the cell septum, clearly saying that now the active wall synthesis is happening in the middle and on the sides. Same is true for bacillus, it happens in the, in the body, but not so much in agrobacterium streptomyces and people have no idea how that happens, right? So there's still, it, this is not the end of the story and just studying E. coli or bacillus will not reveal, you know, the, the, uh, what strategies bacteria adopt
to further peptidoglycan expansion. So obviously these organisms have a different mechanism in place and we know nothing about them. Right? So uh, this is my lab at uh, CCMB. So uh, this is my first student, Santosh. So Santosh, Sadia, and uh, Saishri. All three of them uh, in initiated uh, and then um, uh, they set up my lab. Now uh, Raj is the one who worked on LDTF uh, and uh, Pawan is the one who worked on MEPK and Santosh Sadia worked on MEPSMH and uh, I didn't get a chance to speak about uh, the other's work but maybe sometime I will be doing that. And um, uh, all this work was possible because of very good support from my parent institute CCMB which you know, which is from CSIR and uh, also Department of Biotechnology and Department of Science and Technology. And uh, CCMB is a very beautiful place and then an excellent place to be in for the, particularly for the younger people, right? It, it is like, uh, um, it has excellent infrastructure and then very stimulating environment. So the younger people can, can think of, you know, th this option of uh, working there. And, uh, and thanks for your attention, yeah. And I would be happy to take questions, yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for your insightful talk. I now kindly call upon Dr. Guru Prasad KP, Professor and Associate Director, Research, MSLS Mahe Manipal, to propose the vote of thanks. A very good afternoon to all. On behalf of uh, Manipal School of Licenses, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, it gives me an immense pleasure to deliver a vote of thanks to this August gathering. First and more first, uh, on behalf of MSLS and MAHE, I thank Honorable Dr. Manjula Reddy, Chief Scientist, CSIR, CCMB, Hyderabad, for her presence and delivering MAHE and Dr. J.B. Butt Memorial Oration. Thank you, Madam. We are grateful to Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, Vice Chancellor, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, for his presence, delivering a presidential address, and honoring the chief guest with the citation, and also for the support extended to all our activities. Thank you, sir. <laughs> our heartfelt thanks to the family members of Dr. J. V. Butt. Dr. Venkatesh Bhatt, Dr. Nalini Chandrasekhar, and Mr. Chandrasekhar for their continued support in organizing this event. We thank Professor P.M. Gopinath, Professor Satish Shetty, and many other students of Dr. J.V. Bhatt for their valuable contribution and encouragement in all our efforts. We, we sincerely thank Dr. R.P. Pai, Dr. Ravindra Prabhu, and many other well-wishers on this occasion who are present on this uh, as well as virtually. I would like to express thanks to all the HOIs, HODs, faculty members of various institutions of MAHE, and MAHE officials for their presence and support. I also extend my thanks to the audiovisual uh, department, media and press for their support. I sincerely thank our beloved director, Dr. K. Satyamurthy, who is instrumental in organizing this event 
and also many such of our institutes. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. Padmalata Rai, Associate Director, Academics, Manipal School of Life Sciences, Dr. T.S. Murli, Associate Professor, and all the HODs, faculty members, administrative and technical staff, and research scholars of Manipal School of Life Sciences for their involvement and continued support in all aspects of this event. Thank you. I also thank uh, Mr. Venkidesh for invocation, Ms. Apurvajana for introducing the chief guest, and Ms. Anjali Warrior and the, for the master of ceremony, and many others for their support. Thank you. I would like to thank the participants for their presence in the gathering and also virtually. Thank you. My sincerest thanks to everyone who is directly or indirectly participated, helped in organizing this oration. Thank you one and all. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir. We have come to the closing moment of the prestigious Mahe Professor J.V. Bhatt Memorial Oration 2022. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to express immense gratitude to all the honorable dignitaries, special invitees, and everyone present in this hall for allocating their time to grace this occasion today. Thank you and have a good day. <laughs>